How did we, as humans, come to be? Today we'll be examining this eternal question from a Christian perspective, focusing on the two prominent theories, creation and evolution. Creation versus evolution isn't a conflict between science and the Bible. It's about two different starting points, God's word and human ideas. Your starting point will shape how you interpret the evidence. It influences our beliefs, our values, and our understanding of life's purpose. Let's begin with the biblical account of creation. The book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, tells us that God created the universe and all that's within it. This narrative suggests that all life, from the smallest microorganism to the largest whale, is a result of divine intervention. Now imagine a world, blank, empty, void. The biblical narrative paints a picture of God as the ultimate artist, taking this blank canvas and creating a masterpiece filled with galaxies, stars, planets, and of course life. It's a beautiful imagery. This viewpoint details the events described in the book of Genesis happened exactly as written, in six literal 24-hour days. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 tells the story of God's creation of the world. On the first day, God created light in the darkness. On the second, he created the sky. Dry land and plants were created on the third day. On the fourth day, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Water and sky animals were made on the fifth day. And on the sixth day, land animals and people were created. Adam and Eve, the first humans from whom all humanity descends. For succumbing to temptation and eating the fruit of the forbidden tree of knowledge of good and evil, God banished them from Eden and they and their descendants were forced to live lives of hardship. Death and suffering entered the world as a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience, often referred to as the fall. This perspective places God at the very heart of existence. It sees life as a divine gift, intricately designed and purposefully created. It asserts that every creature, every plant, every rock, every star in the night sky is a testament to God's power, creativity, and love. So, creationism is not just a belief about how life came to be, but also a worldview. A worldview where every sunrise and every sunset, every breath we take, every beat of our hearts is a reminder of our divine origin and purpose. Creationism, therefore, presents a worldview where God is at the center of existence. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the theory of evolution. This theory, friends, is a bit like a long, slow dance of life. It's a process that's been going on for billions of years, shaping and reshaping species in response to the environment. Evolution is grounded in two main principles, natural selection and mutation. Now, natural selection, that's survival of the fittest. It's nature's way of ensuring that the strongest and most adaptable members of a species survive to pass on their genes. If a critter can't adapt to its environment or compete with its peers, it doesn't get to stick around for the next round. Mutation, on the other hand, is the wild card in this game of life. It's a change in an organism's DNA, its genetic blueprint, if you will. Most mutations are harmless, but every once in a while one comes along that gives an organism an edge, makes it better suited to its environment. That critter then has a better chance of surviving and passing on its advantageous genes to its offspring. Now, evolutionists view life as a product of these random, natural processes. They argue that over billions of years, these processes have gradually shaped and refined life on Earth. From the simplest single-celled organisms to the vast array of complex creatures we see today. There's no grand design or purpose, they say, just an endless cycle of adaptation and change. And it's not just about survival, either. Evolution also encompasses the development of new traits and abilities, the diversification of species, and the complex web of relationships between different forms of life. It's a continual process of trial and error, success and failure, with nature acting as both judge and jury. Evolution thus offers a perspective where natural processes dictate the course of life. It's a perspective that can be challenging to reconcile with the belief in a divine creator. But as we move forward in our discussion, we'll dive into how these two perspectives might intersect and interact in intriguing and unexpected ways. Evolution, like intelligent design, cannot be directly observed or tested, yet this is often overlooked by non-believing evolutionists. Consequently, data is interpreted through the lens of a naturalistic worldview, disregarding other possible explanations. The origins of the universe and life cannot be directly tested or observed. Accepting either creation or evolution involves a degree of faith, 
since we cannot travel back in time to witness these origins, rejecting creation on certain grounds should logically lead to rejecting evolution as well. Christians can uphold their faith in the biblical account of creation, while also acknowledging the scientific evidence that supports the theory of evolution. It's a way of saying, yes, we believe in God, and yes, we also believe in science. There is a creator by the name of Jesus Christ to whom we are accountable. Evolution, as often presented today, supports atheism by providing a framework for explaining the development of life without a creator God. In this way, modern evolutionary theories function as an alternative creation story for the belief system of atheism. The Bible clearly states that God is the creator. Therefore, any scientific interpretation that excludes God's involvement in the origins of life is incompatible with scripture. The gap between evolutionists and creationists isn't as big as you might think. We both study the universe and agree on the basic nature of the data we observe. We understand and appreciate the fundamental laws of how things work. We both love science. The difference lies in how we interpret the larger historical significance of this data. This interpretation goes beyond our ability to observe facts and perform repeatable experiments. It depends on our untestable assumptions about the past, which nobody was present to see. Here's why this matters. Evolutionists rely on a human-centered approach. They don't believe in any higher authority or source of information beyond their own minds. They're unwilling to check their work against an answer key because they don't think one exists. I don't know about you, but I can't always trust my brain to remember where I left my keys to my car, let alone figure out how we came to be. In fact, I would humbly submit to you that a human-centered approach leaves a lot to be desired. In the end, what can we conclude from this discourse? Hopefully you came into the realization of your limitations, and I believe that we are meant to understand our need to depend on the one eternal absolute source of truth and understanding in the universe, our Creator Jesus Christ. There is something much better. You see, God loved us enough to tell us exactly what He did and when He did it, especially in the most important matters of our origin, purpose, and destiny. He wanted us to know Him and to understand that He would one day enter into His creation to save us from our sin. Philippians 2. If He's an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-everything God who wants us to know Him, wouldn't we be much better off trusting His revelation of history, the universe, and everything? And while we may not have all the answers, it's the quest for knowledge that truly counts. It challenges our understanding of the world and our place in it. Jesus, who created the universe, is not bound by space or time. Though he cannot be measured, he provides us with ample evidence of his existence through the universe he designed for us. That's why I'll trust his explanation every time.